Good afternoon. Welcome back to the Phoenix Virtual Event Space after a week and a half break here. Good to have you all back and good to have Mr. Tony Gale back for the portrait series. Today is part one, planning and casting a portrait shoot hosted by Sony. So we'd like to thank Sony for hosting today's event and Sony Artisan of Imagery and Mainstay here on the event space. Tony Gale. Tony, what's going on? Not much. How are you? I'm doing good. It's good to host you. I feel like I don't get to host you anymore. You know, I feel left out. I, you know, I missed this repartee. I, I missed it too. That's why I'm here today. I'm like, no, I'm not letting Tony host himself today. I'm, I'm jumping on, even if it's for a hot minute. But uh, Tony, I'll let you take over because you do it so well. And I'll see you at the end for some Q&A. Thank you very much. Hi, everybody. I am Tony Gale. I'm a Sony artist in imagery. And as Derek said, uh, today is the first part of a three-part series on portrait photo shoots. So part one, planning and casting a portrait shoot. Uh, I am a Sony artist in imagery. This is happening because of Sony in the B&H event space. I'm also a BenQ ambassador, a man photo ambassador in x Right Colorado, in case any of those brands come up. And I am a commercial people and portrait photographer based in New York, some editorial, some corporate, some advertising, I shoot for a range of clients, but almost all of it is people and portraits. And I know this looks like a lot. Coming up, we've got a bunch of stuff. We have uh, parts two and three of this series, creating portraits in the studio, creating portraits on location. Uh, oh, and part four, post-production image delivery. I forgot about that one. Splashes and pours with Sony Speedlights. Uh, a couple lesson and critique series is where I'll do a presentation and a lesson on a topic. The following session will ask you to submit some pictures and I'll go over them live and say what I think. And then we have three photo walks, a portrait photo walk in uh, on April 24th, Central Park Waterfalls at May 8th, and another portrait photo walk on June 20th. Uh, also, a couple of things I want to mention for those of you who don't know, those of you who have seen me before, well, this will all be old hat. Um, if you have questions about Sony cameras, if you want to know if there's deals, if you just are curious or you like them, or even you just want to know about photography tips that aren't necessarily Sony specific, alphauniverse.com is a great resource. Also, Sony introduced this fall uh, the Sony Alpha Universe forums. It's a very pleasant, uh, so far I'm not seeing a single troll, uh, place to ask questions if you're like, how does this work on my camera? Or, hey, look at these cool pictures or whatever. Uh, the Alpha Universe forums are free. You can get to them at alphauniverse.com. Just go to community and then community forums. Uh, there's also the Sony Alpha Female Facebook group where they are continuing to do micro grants every week, $500 micro grants based on a specific topic. You do not have to identify as female to enter. It is also a very uh, pleasant Facebook group. We know not every photo group on the internet is nice. The Sony Alpha female group is great. It's moderated. I haven't seen any trolls there either. And then in addition to what I have coming up, right after me, today we have Monica Sigmund. Well, not right after, an hour after I finish. Monica Sigmund doing Welcome to Our World. Uh, Monica is another Sony artisan, a uh, great photographer. Uh, looks like in, a, in May, aside from what I'm doing, Autumn Schrock is doing a yoga for photographers thing and shooting landscape with telephoto lenses, which I'm a big fan of. And then Scott Robert Lim, another Sony artisan, is doing cinematic weddings with constant light uh, later in May as well. So stay tuned for all of that. All right, so I'm gonna do, be doing planning and casting a portrait shoot. So why a portrait photo shoot? So one thing, I've, I've been thinking about this a lot, especially with AI coming along and seeing a lot of really interesting things people are doing with AI. An AI image to me is an image, right? It's, it's obviously not a photograph because it's created digitally. It's an illustration, although I've seen people argue about that too. Um, to me, a portrait photo shoot is interacting with a specific person and trying to capture a piece of their personality. And that can only be done in real time for me. Like I'm not taking a conglomeration of existing images and trying to make something creates an illustration of that person. It's like a painting or whatever, that's fine. But to actually capture that moment, to interact with them and get them to loosen up and feel relaxed and respond to what you're saying and really get that moment, that's why I like portrait photo shoots. 
you meet new people, you go to interesting places, and you really put someone at ease and create something new. That's why, even with AI coming up, I still think portrait photo shoots are very important. Uh, and I think there's a lot of value to that. So today we're going to be going over planning and casting a portrait shoot, concept, gear, casting, and location. Uh, also, I should mention, if you have comments, please put them in either the question box or the Q&A or whatever, depending on what platform you're watching on. And uh, any questions we'll try and get to at the end. Uh, Derek will let me know what they are when they come up. All right, so to start with, concept. So you want to do a portrait photo shoot. Great. Why? What's the reason for the portrait photo shoot? And who is the shoot for? So is the shoot for a client? Is someone hiring you to take that picture? Who's a third party? For example, I shoot for magazines and corporations a lot. You know, maybe a magazine editor calls me and says, we want a photograph of this person for our March issue. Well, it's too late for that. For our July issue. So then there's a client who's asking me to take that photo shoot and everything from here on forward has to take into account what their needs are. For example, there's a magazine I used to shoot for a lot where if I was going to shoot a cover, I needed knew I needed a vertical for the cover with space on the sides for copy and on the top for copy for the masthead or for the title. I knew I needed a spread for the opener. I knew I needed an insert for the article and I know I needed a table of contents picture for the article. So I needed to get at least four portraits with specific needs. So the concept and the planning need to account for that. You know, what is the end use? Uh, maybe the reason you're doing it is because the person you're photographing hired you to take that picture. Maybe it's a headshot. Uh, maybe it's a family portrait. Maybe it's just somebody who wants cool pictures. Could be any number of things. Uh, if they are hiring you or if another person is hiring you, you have to think about and have a conversation with them about what they need, right? Because whoever's paying the bills their opinion matters the most. Hopefully they're hiring you or bringing you in. Even if they're not hiring you, maybe you're doing it as a favor for a friend. They have a specific need. And so you need to understand what that need is before you move on to the next steps. On the other hand, maybe you're just doing it for yourself. Maybe the shoot is for yourself. You want to make a new picture. Maybe it doesn't matter who it's for. Or maybe you want to photograph a specific person because they look really cool or do really cool things or work in a cool place or who knows. Then you are the person who matters most in the concept. Thing. But you have to think about all of those things, what the need is and whose opinion needs to be taken into account the most. Hopefully, it's all a little bit collaborative. You know, I'm still interested in what the person in front of the camera thinks, even if they're not hiring me, because the more comfortable they are, the better the picture is going to be. Uh, I know some people disagree on that. You know, Richard Avedon famously took a picture of the Duke and Duchess of what of King? I don't remember where. The Duke and Duchess, uh, the king who abdicated in the UK and lied to them about a dog being hit in the street to get this very sad expression on both of their faces. That's not the kind of photography that interests me as much as Richard Avedon was an incredible photographer. And if you're not familiar with his work, you should look it up. I'm interested in putting people at ease. I'm not interested in manipulating them to get a sad expression or an upset expression. But reasonable minds can differ. So everything I'm going to talk about, somebody out there is going to disagree with every single thing I say. It may not be all everything, but First thing I say is someone's going to disagree. The second thing, someone's going to disagree. And that's fine. There's very few things, especially in photography, that there is one right answer for. If something works for you, that's great. And if it doesn't, try something else. I'm talking about what I think works for most people and definitely what works for me. But if you disagree, that's fine. All right. So here's an example of some client work. For this particular client, New York Moves Magazine, they don't care if it's vertical or horizontal. They just do the layout as they see fit. This is for a corporate client, just standard portrait headshots. This is a picture I did for myself, another one for myself. And you can see 
when it's for yourself, you don't have to worry about, is it going to be small? Is it going to be big? Is it going to be horizontal? Is it going to be vertical? You can do whatever you want, which is great. Um, although sometimes having someone else be part of it adds to the creativity. And as we get to later in terms of uh, finding people to photograph, having a client can sometimes get you access that just isn't possible on your own. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit. So you have a concept in mind. You know what you want to photograph. You may or may not know who, but you have an idea of what. So then you want to think about your gear, right? You can't take a picture without a camera. Camera is pretty important. So what camera do you want to get? Obviously, I'm a Sony artisan, so I use Sony cameras. I honestly do think Sony cameras are the right choice for almost everyone, uh, but there's always exceptions. And certainly, if you have a camera now and you're happy with it, that's great. And maybe when you upgrade, Sony could be the answer, maybe not. There is no one right answer for everyone, and there's a lot of great stuff out there. I, Like I said, I think Sony solves a lot of problems and makes excellent stuff more so than most of the other brands. But uh, hopefully what we're talking about will still be useful to you, even though I will talk about specific cameras and lenses. Uh, and, you know, if you're taking pictures, that's fantastic, whatever the camera is, even if it's your phone. Although the Sony Xperia, you can shoot raw, you can control your shutter speed. It's pretty cool. All right, so there's a bunch of cameras. You're probably not buying a camera for the first time for your first photo shoot, but maybe you're upgrading for a photo shoot. Maybe you're looking to upgrade. The camera I'm using the most right now is the Sony Alpha 7 R5. In part, that's because I like the high resolution. I've used the R series from the very first one. I had the R, the R2, the R3, the R4, and the R5. Um, but also because they've added AI-based autofocus that allows the camera to understand that the subject in front of you is a person, for example, even if the person is faced away from you. So Sony's eye autofocus is absolutely incredible. It's magic. It is just amazing what it can do, but it can't focus on the eye if the eye is facing the other direction, right? So if your subject's moving around a lot, the eye goes away, can't focus on it. With the Alpha 7 R5, it still knows it's a person. So based on the just the shape of everything. So we'll focus on the back of the head and track that so that when they turn around, the focus is almost there and it'll get back right away. It's really, really incredible. I also use the Alpha 1 a lot. The reason I might use the Alpha 1 instead of the R5 is for the speed. So the Alpha 1 is a faster camera. The autofocus faster. Uh, it can do up to 30 frames a second. So if I'm photographing somebody who's moving a lot, maybe a dancer, uh, or an athlete that's doing a lot of stuff, the Alpha One might be the answer. But those are the two cameras I use the most. All that said, I got an email from somebody the other day talking about the Alpha 6400, which is one step up from the 6100, and about feeling like it's often criticized as not a good enough camera. And the Alpha 6100, the 6400, the 6600 are still excellent cameras. There's a spectrum of cameras that are really, really good. Yes, you will get more faster autofocus, higher resolution, maybe better ISO performance, all those things maybe as you spend more money. But that isn't to say that you can't get amazing photos with something like the Alpha 6100 or the 6400 or the 6600. You can absolutely get great pictures with those cameras. And there are people who prefer the compact size. There is, like I said, no right one answer for everyone. So I just wanted to put that in there. All right. So you've got whatever camera you're going to use. Uh, if you're doing a professional shoot, I really encourage you to bring two cameras just in case. I've certainly had situations where something weird happens and I switch bodies or where I have two setups and I'll use two cameras or have one lens on one camera, one lens on another camera. So there's a lot of lenses out there in the world. There are certain lenses that are considered portrait lenses. Um, you can certainly take a portrait with any lens that exists. Uh, it may or may not be flattering to your subject. It may or may not solve the purpose of what you're taking the portrait for. Um, but I mean, you could shoot a portrait with a 14 millimeter if you wanted. You could shoot it with a 600 millimeter if you wanted. 
That said, generally, the portrait range is like considered 70 millimeters to 150 millimeters. Somewhere in there is sort of the standard portrait range. Um, I put in several of the lenses I really like for portraits. The 70 to 200 GM2, absolutely amazing. Super fast autofocus, incredibly sharp. Uh, I like long lens portraits. I think it could be a really useful lens. The 24-70-2.8 GM2, also super fast, also great, uh, very, very sharp. This lens in particular, I like for its versatility. That standard zoom range, 24 to 70, I can get fairly tight. I can shoot wide if I'm doing something where I need to move around a lot and change things a lot. I absolutely want to use a zoom over a prime just for the speed. So instead of moving back and forth or taking the time to switch lenses and maybe losing some of that interaction and uh, communication with the subject, I can just zoom. Uh, so 2470, very versatile. The 8518, the Sony 8518, I think is one of the best lenses dollar for dollar that there is. It's $600. All of these prices, by the way, are from this morning on the BH website. So this morning being April 17th, 2023. So if you're watching this in six months, who knows what the prices are? Or even tomorrow. I don't know. You know, prices change. There's deals. There aren't deals. Who knows? But the prices are as of today. Um, the 8518, great lens, very compact, $600, hard to beat, really great lens. So the 3514 is a lens, the G Master is a lens that people tend to think of as not a portrait lens. However, I realized after years of looking at pictures I'd taken with a 2470 that a lot of times when I did an environmental portrait with a lot of the environment, I was at 35 millimeters. Very rarely wider, often not tighter. 35 millimeters was my sweet spot. So I bought a 35 millimeter lens. Um, I think for environmentals, it's great. I wouldn't use it for a tight portrait, but some people might. The 135-18 GM, really fantastic lens, super sharp. This is where the eye autofocus really comes into play because I can photograph at 1.8 and get sharp eyes with that fall off, that 1.8 fall off in that bokeh. I really, really like that lens. 24-105 also a very versatile lens, 100 STF. For those of you who haven't used it, STF is smooth transition focus. It's a lens that uses magic and voodoo to have very, very smooth bokeh. And then the 51.2, another lens I love, great for low light, uh, available light portraits. All right, so you've got your camera, you've got your lens or lenses. Uh, you know, you're going to decide all that based on what you're photographing, where you're photographing, and what you have available, right? If you have a 50 millimeter lens and that's the only lens, you're probably going to use your 50 millimeter lens, right? You're not, unless somebody's paying you, you're probably not going to go out and rent another lens. As you photograph more, you may see that you wish that you had a longer, shorter lens or whatever, and then you should buy it. So, do you want props? Props could be furniture. They could be background stuff. These are both locations I rented in LA that had really cool props. You know, people never know what to do with their hands. Sometimes giving them something to do with their hands helps. So do you want props? Do you not want props? It really depends on the purpose of the photo and just what your vision is. Then you've got wardrobe. What is the person going to wear? So Typically, when I'm doing a photograph, uh, for myself, I just ask people to bring a few options and we'll try a few different things. If I'm shooting a bigger job, I have a wardrobe stylist. So with props, with wardrobe, with makeup, if there's a client and the budget is there, I would always encourage people to bring in a team, have somebody whose expertise is makeup, have somebody whose expertise is wardrobe, have somebody whose expertise is propping. Because they, they're going to have a vision that without the experience, I'm just not going to have. They're going to be able to give you options. You know, you should communicate with them. Not It shouldn't just be a one-way street where they put somebody in whatever and that's just what it is. 
but a big part of anything is understanding where your strengths are and where your weaknesses are. And if you can bring someone in whose strengths are what your weaknesses are, that's fantastic. But think about what the wardrobe is. Think about does the wardrobe make play make sense for the type of photo you want to make and where you're going to photograph it. Um, I do like if someone brings multiple things and they're not sure what to wear, I also ask, I always ask them, what is the thing that they like the best that they feel the most comfortable in? And I think that is often the best way to start because the more comfortable they are to begin with, the more comfortable they will be throughout the shoot. So if they love this sweater, even if you're not sure about the sweater, you know, spend 10 or 15 minutes photographing them in that sweater so they feel good and then try something else. So this gentleman, for example, outfit one, outfit two, outfit three. If you have the time, try different things. It is both helpful if you're trying to deliver multiple images uh, because it's much more interesting if you're giving somebody six images, if they're not six images that all kind of look the same because the light is the same and the wardrobe is the same. I think it's better if it's two pictures in wardrobe A, two pictures in outfit B, two pictures in outfit C or whatever. It just makes it feel like it wasn't just variations on the same thing. All right. So you've got your camera, you've got your lens, you've got your, pro your props, you've got your wardrobe, you've got your lighting. What lighting are you going to bring? So some of that is going to depend on if you're shooting in studio or on location in indoors or outdoors. Do you want something big and soft? I find it's hard to go wrong with a big soft light source, but that may or may not be the vision. And sometimes even though it's hard to go wrong, it's not the best thing. You know, available light can be beautiful. I think if it's a sunny day, move into the shade, bring some fill. Late, af late afternoon light where you get that beautiful warm tone. Another big soft light, mess around with some colors. Maybe try black and white. Uh, strobe outside, adding it with the existing light, with the daylight, combining the two. Uh, constant source outside, that works great if you're in the shade. If you're not in the shade, if you're in direct sun, um, any constant source light that you can easily carry around is probably not going to be powerful enough. Somebody else may disagree. Um, in a few, in next month, when Scott Robert Lim does his wedding stuff with constant lights, he may disagree. In my experience, I'm only going to use constant lights outside if I'm in the shade or if it's a cloudy day. Uh, speed lights, portable, very easy to use, bigger strobes, or speed lights, bigger strobes again. So one limitation with lighting is going to be the space you're in. If you don't know where you're going to be, you need to bring more options. Like if you have no idea, sometimes I'm photographing someone and I'm going to their house or their office. Maybe it's a big space. Maybe it's a small space. There's no way for me to know. I tend to like big soft light sources because they're so forgiving. But if the space isn't big enough for a big soft light source and that's all I've brought, that's a problem, right? I have to be able to solve the solution. To solve the problem, I have to be able to create a solution. I have to be able to make every situation work. Uh, so options are important. Ideally, if you can get someone to send you photos of wherever you're going to be photographing, if it's going to be a location, you know, oh, you know, my living room looks great. We, let's take the picture there. Fantastic. Take a couple pictures with the phone, send them to me so I can get a sense of it. Most of the time people will do that. Sometimes the pictures aren't that helpful, but it at least gives you an idea. So this was a mayor, the mayor of uh, Washington, D.C. at City Hall. Strobes with a little uh, diffusion for the sun. There's a lot of different lighting. I will get more into the lighting uh, when I talk the next couple about studio portraits and location portraits because it gets more specific. Um, but just to do a high level overview. And then other. So it's not as simple as just a camera, a lens, a light, and your subject. Uh, it could be especially if you're outside, um, but it maybe isn't. Do you need gaffer's tape? 
I always have gaffer's tape. Do you need extension cords? If you're using lights that plug in, probably. A speaker, Sony makes some great wireless uh, Bluetooth speakers. Do you need to bring some water? Anytime I think a shoot's gonna be longer than an hour, I bring a bottle of water. Um, and if it's a client shoot, I bring enough water for everybody. Snacks, same thing. Is it an all day shoot or an hour or two? Bringing you know, a bag of chocolate covered almonds or some dried mango or something, everybody will love you for it. Clamps could be useful. Maybe you're photographing in somebody's living room and there's a curtain hanging in a way that you don't like, you can clamp it up. Extra cards for your camera. Always, 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 always bring extra cards. Uh, there's just no situation where you're going to regret doing that. Extra batteries, same thing. Um, hopefully everything's charged. I mean, with the Sony Z batteries in particular, I rarely have to change batteries on a shoot, but I still bring a bunch of extras just in case. You know, maybe the camera got turned on on my bag, and even though it'll go to sleep, if the bag keeps hitting the shutter button, it'll keep waking up, and over time, the battery will die. There's a ton of miscellaneous stuff, and you just want to think through on every photo shoot. I'm going to walk in the door. What am I going to do? What could go wrong? What contingencies do I need to plan for? What can I bring to make this go as smoothly as possible? So a lot of things to consider, a lot of options, and you want to think about every one. All right. So then moving on to casting. Who are you photographing? Is it an actor, an actress, a friend, a neighbor, a family, a bride, a groom, a high school senior, your cousin? Who is the client? Like we talked about at the beginning. Is it for a magazine? Is it for a favor? Is it for you? And does it need to be a specific person or could it be anyone? So if it's a specific person, there's a, a couple of things to think about. Is it someone that you are photographing because a client asked you to and that's the end? As I mentioned earlier with access, Access is the most difficult thing. So the mayor of Washington, D.C. that I photographed there, Mayor Bowser, I had wanted to photograph women mayors of, New York, of U.S. cities for years, and I couldn't figure out how to get access. Because if I call up the mayor of any city and say, hey, I'd like to do your portrait, they're going to say, why? Well, first of all, I'm not going to talk to the mayor. I'm going to talk to who knows. They're going to say, why? And then when I say, just because I want to do a photo project, they're going to stay that's nice. We'll get back to you. And then I will never hear from them again because people are busy and most people don't like to be photographed. So if someone doesn't want to be photographed in general, and the only reason that you want to photograph them is because you want to, it's a pretty high hurdle to get access to that person. So if there's someone specific you want to get to, you have to, it helps to think of a way that that person would benefit or someone else that would benefit that can intercede on your behalf. So with the mayors, I photographed the mayor of Fort Worth, Texas, the mayor of Baltimore, the mayor of Washington, DC, uh, the mayor of Har West Hartford, the mayor of Rochester. Uh, I realized that a magazine I photographed for might be interested in that. So I approached them and I said, Hey, I've got this idea. Would you guys be interested? And they said, sure. So all of a sudden it was for a magazine. And when it's for a magazine, people say yes. You know, not everybody, but most people, they want the publicity, right? Especially if you're a politician or if you're someone that what you do uh, requires awareness uh, or people are flattered, right? People like to feel like their, rec their contribution to the world is recognized and that their value is recognized because everyone has something they can contribute and everybody has value and many people don't feel like that's acknowledged. So if you can get maybe a magazine or a nonprofit or somebody who relates to whatever that person does or who they are on board, uh, that's a great way to get access to people that you might not otherwise be able to. Is it going get, to get you access to Julia Roberts? Probably not unless it's a really big magazine and then the but you never know. Every publication I'm aware of will accept pitches. If you reach out to them and you know, reach out to it, the photo editor or the editor and say, I've got this great idea for a project. They want that because they're always hungry for content. 
Now, they may or may not like your idea, but keep trying and somebody probably will because otherwise they have to come up with ideas. And it's harder to come up with ideas than to just say, hey, that's a good idea when someone else has one. So think about how to get access. Um, and then maybe it can just be anyone. Maybe you just want to do cool portraits of people because it's fun, or you just want to look for people who have cool looks or cool hair or cool tattoos. Um, there's a couple of websites I use all the time. I have no affiliation with these websites. You can use them or not. It makes absolutely no difference to me. Um, and I'm not endorsing them, just to be clear. But I use Backstage a lot. So at Backstage, um, you do have to, at least in the New York area, you have to pay for a post. I think it's $25. If you do a posting on a casting website, you want to be as specific as possible. Um, I'll say why, what I'm looking for. And generally when I do a casting like this, I'm not looking for specific things. So I will say, I'm not looking for a specific look. Um, you'll want to, but if you are be clear about that too, maybe you only want people with black hair, or maybe you only want people with nose piercings or whatever. If that's what you want, be clear about that. Um, and if you're not looking for something specific, be clear about that too. Be clear about how the photo will be used. So I usually say the photos might be used for stock. The likelihood of that is extremely low. It's mostly so that if someone approaches and asks to license a picture I've taken, that's been communicated and I have a model release. But if you want to sign a model release, tell them that. I would include your website because let's imagine you're someone, especially who's newish to the industry and looking to build up your portfolio and you see a casting, someone's looking for pictures of people and you have no idea if this person is a good photographer, a bad photographer, obviously that's subjective, but maybe the style of work they do is not what interests you. So if you include a link to your website, it's gonna make people feel more comfortable and people who aren't interested aren't gonna respond, hopefully. It is true that sadly often, a lot of people don't actually read the entire casting. So I will often tell people, when you respond to my casting, tell me what your favorite color is. And I'll put that in the last sentence or two so that people only see it if they read the entire thing. And then anybody who doesn't tell me their favorite color, I can just filter out because they didn't read the whole casting. And it is a drag when you reach out to someone that looks really cool. And then they're like, oh, what is this? Oh, no, I'm not interested in that. So you've wasted time, you've waiting for them to get back to you. You've, it's just annoying. Um, so if you say, tell me what your favorite color is, and they say, hey, my favorite color is blue, you know they read the whole thing. And so their interest level is likely higher. Um, I typically, because I might license the picture, hypothetically, most of the time it's not, um, but I do use them in things like this. I will often pay people $25. Maybe that makes sense to you. Maybe it doesn't. I know plenty of people that don't pay anything and just offer pictures. I pay people, pay people $25 normally plus five pictures of their choice for personal use uh, and their own self-promotion, um, not for a company's website or anything like that. That Then that has to actually, they have to pay me. I'm not going to pay them. Um, how that works is up to you. Uh, how many pictures you might want to give someone is up to you. But like anything, you want to think of it as what works for me and how can I make it work for the other person as well? You know, if all it is is I'm taking a picture of them and they get nothing, why would they do it? You know, if it's for a publication, they get publicity. That's why they do it. But if it's just you building your portfolio or practicing or just wanting to do more pictures for Instagram or whatever. And I do a lot of pictures just for myself, just because I think it's important to be shooting as much as you can. Um, it needs to benefit them as well. Uh, so you want to be as specific as you can. Uh, there's also a website called Casting Networks that I've used a lot. Um, they did update their website and I find it much more confusing than it used to be. There are other websites as well. I'm sure there's stuff I don't even know about. Uh, there are websites that are probably a little sketchy. So really pay attention to 
what the website looks like and how people are responding. If the website is free for everyone, um, I find that the flake factor is quite high. So I used to do Craigslist a lot for people. And I found that two thirds of the people that I scheduled just wouldn't show up. Uh, and that's, you know, that's a lot. That's a waste of time. If I'm renting a studio or if I'm, you know, standing on some street corner going to Central Park waiting for someone and they don't come, that's really a drag. Especially if I have someone scheduled at one and then somebody scheduled at 2.30 and then someone scheduled at four and the 2.30 person doesn't show up. Then all of a sudden I'm sitting there for two and a half hours and I can't leave because I've got a four o'clock. Uh, one way I do get around that with all of these things is I will typically schedule two or three people at the same time. And then if I'm shooting for myself and then I will rotate through them. So I'll photograph person one, person one can go change into their second outfit. I'll photograph person two, then person one comes back. Uh, and then if someone doesn't show up, it's less of a big deal, but you know, try what works for you. Um, but how are some other ways to find people? So the access we talked about referrals. If you have a specific project in mind, I, for a couple of years, did a project on interesting people where I would ask people to say why they thought someone was interesting, uh, write it down, and then make an introduction. So if Derek thought, you know, Danny was interesting, he could write down, Danny is interesting because he's awesome or whatever. Uh, and then he would make an introduction to me and Danny. And then I would reach out to Danny because Danny was referred by someone he knew and because it was for something specific and there was a website, all that. Uh, I think I only had one person not respond. Uh, people loved it. It was great. So referrals, if you know someone who knows that person and can make an introduction, that that's really helpful. Uh, twice, just as uh, a thing to do, because I don't like to do it. Uh, I did a month of photographing a stranger every day for a month. And I would just walk up to people and say, hey, can I take your picture? Um, in doing that, I found that I was more successful getting people to say yes, if I could identify something about them specifically that I thought was cool. One of the first things I did was walk up to somebody he had a newsstand in the subway because I thought the newsstand looked cool. And I'm like, hey, can I take your picture? I'm trying to take a picture of someone every day. And he said no, because it was weird to him. Now, if I'd said, can I take your picture because the newsstand looks awesome? He might have said yes. Uh, you know, I've told, you know, people, your hat looks cool. Your rings look cool. Your shoes look cool. Uh, in general, when I've said things like that, people say yes. Your mileage may vary. Uh, it's going to depend on your personality and who you are. But it's a good thing to do. It's an exercise to try because I don't know about all of you watching, but for me, it's really awkward to just walk up to a random stranger and ask to take their picture. It feels it's very difficult for me. So I did it twice for a month just to do it. But it's a good exercise. Um and then a lot of people use Instagram. So there's a lot of aspiring models or just interesting people on Instagram. If there's a topic, like maybe you really want to photograph people who knit. I'm sure that there are knitting hashtags on Instagram and you can start looking through, find people in your city who knit and then just start reaching out. Instagram is a great resource for that. Or even, you know, aspiring models, people that are really into cars, um, I know a lot of people who are really into car culture and photograph people with their cars or just their cars. Uh, there's a ton of options like that. You just have to get out there and see what makes sense to you and give it a shot. All right. So you have your cameras, you have your lenses, you have your other gear, uh, you have your subject and why you're photographing them. And then where is the photo shoot? Is it going to be a studio or on location? Uh, for the purposes of this, discussion a studio is anywhere that you can control completely so it could be your garage or it could be someone's living room but it's somewhere where the environment doesn't matter and you can control all of the lighting in the environment so if you can move the furniture and can turn off all the lights and control everything your living room can be a studio if the living room is part of the picture then it's a location shoot if it's outside it's a location shoot uh you just have to decide what makes most sense. Sometimes the location is context and makes the picture stronger. Sometimes 
having a clean background or building a set is stronger. So studio locate studio, uh, studio. This was at the Javits Center though. So it was somewhere where I could control the lighting. I put up the backdrop, but it was still the Javits. This was at the Sony booth at the Photo Expo a few years ago. Uh, this is location, an actor for a magazine. Location, location. If you're in LA or ever in LA, the old zoo, super cool place to photograph in Griffith Park. Um, so studio or location, is there a specific place? Is it, as I mentioned before, somewhere where the location matters or adds something? So this was for a sportswear catalog. He's wearing sportswear. He's got a basketball. He's got a whistle. Photographing him by this basketball hoop made more sense. If you, if you remove that basketball hoop, why is he standing here where it's sort of dark and there's trees? That doesn't make any sense. So that location matter, getting that context. This was for my interesting person, prod, people project. He was a professor at Cooper Union for like 50 years and in this office for like 45 years. So if I photograph him on a white background, it's not as interesting as photographing him in his space. So the location really mattered. Uh, this gentleman was the disability advocate for New York City Parks. So we photographed him in a park. Uh, this was also an interesting person project. This was just someone who was super organized, and that's why people thought they were interesting. So we wanted to show the organization and just the fact that every trinket was there. Somebody who makes uh, jewelry and clothing. Uh, the mayor of Fort Worth, Texas, in front of City Hall having some location made sense. The mayor of Baltimore in Baltimore City Hall. So the locations matter. If they do, you want to find that location. You also want to get access. Uh, you may have an issue. We'll talk about this when I do the location one. You may need a permit and you may need insurance. Um, if you're a professional photographer, I really encourage you to get insurance. It's not that much. Uh, if you're not, see what you can do. See what makes sense. Um, all right, I went pretty quick. So let's see if there are any questions. We'll see if Derek's paying attention. Uh, in the meantime, uh, you can find out more about me on my website. You can find more about Sony on alphauniverse.com, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. And I have a podcast that we're sort of taking a little bit of a hiatus on. I have one or two more to publish, but I'm taking a little break on that. Tony, we're going to give them another minute here. I'm, I'm in shock. There's no questions. I'm going to throw a question out. What's what's the one thing you see in, in your years of teaching people, the one thing with beginners and portraits that you see forgotten the most, or I don't want to say messed up because I feel like it's such a harsh term for people starting out. One thing that that really trips people up the most. Um, with portraits, I... <sighs> That's that. That's a difficult thing to say. Um, lighting, I think almost everyone, myself included, when you start out with portraits, you're paying more attention to the person than you are to the light. Mm. And obviously the person is the most important thing, but often if you just move them five feet or turn them 45 degrees, just a little thing can make a huge difference because someone can look amazing and have a great expression and be super relaxed. But if the lighting is really harsh uh, or the background's so blown up that it's wrapping around, um, then the picture doesn't work. So, I'm, here and I'm like, I like want to ask more and get more out, but I'm like, I know we have more to come. We're very, we're in the beginning stages. So I'm going to hold off. I don't want to spoil the entire series with my questions. Here. Well, you can ask questions, you know, who knows if somebody's going to watch the next one. We don't know. You're right. You're right. Well, Elizabeth took the mic out of my hand. She has a question. Do you do children's portraits? If so, what tips do you have for children's portraits? So I have, but very, very, very rarely. I have a 10 month old daughter. So I photographed her a bunch. Um, I think, with children, so bear, bear all that in mind that I am not a child portrait specialist. So I'll give you my opinion, but it's not as informed opinion and it's an opinion as someone who does it exclusively. Children are easily distracted, as are we all, frankly. Um, and they can be in a situation where they feel uncomfortable or they feel pressure. And if the child feels pressure, uh, I think it's even harder for a kid than for an adult. So it's really important, I think, for the kid to feel at ease. Um, 
And often if you just interact with them, like they're a person, which isn't always the case, uh, you know, even if they're four, if you're like, hey, what do you like? What's your favorite spot in this room? You know, what what are you playing with? What Where do you want to be? What do you want to do? Even is there a picture that you want to take? You know, let them make that stupid expression that their parents hate. And we all know, you know, every kid I think that exists <laughs> wants to do some crazy expression that the parents are never going to approve. Although sometimes those pictures are awesome. Uh, but let them do that and then say, okay, cool. We did that. Can we just, you know, can we do a couple with a little smile? Maybe they'll say yes. Maybe they'll say no. Uh, and just shoot a ton. I photograph a lot. I mean, I just do a lot of frames on an adult. If I'm photographing a kid, I will frequently put my camera just into motor drive and just blast through because you might get that, you know, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. And then for a half a second in between, they're pleased with themselves. So they smile for real. Um, so that that was my meandering suggestions. I hope that's helpful. What's the best focal range for, for kids? Is it to go wider or to go telephoto and kind of let them run around and do their thing? If assuming you're not um, in the studio. I would actually say wider and because they're going to run around. So one of the things that is the biggest drag when you're doing a portrait is to have a frame that's almost perfect, except you chop somebody's ear off because they were moving around too much, too much. And kids move around a lot. So always, anytime I say always, it's nothing is always. But in general, if you shoot wider, you can always crop, but you can't really add uh, an arm that's missing because you shot too tight. And if a kid's like doing this, you know, he, you can't control that. And it's probably better to just let them do it because they're having fun and you'll get that actual joy in them. And if you're just shooting wider, you can crop and recompose later. Okay. Perfect. Well, Tony, it looks like we had an easy day. We're letting you off the hook early today. So huge thank you. All right. I'll go put my feet up. There you go. Go kick your feet up and uh, don't relax for too long because we're going to be seeing you a lot over the next couple of months. And again, you guys saw Tony's schedule. You can always replay this and all of our online content at facebook.com backslash BH event space. Or if you go over to vimeo.com backslash BH event space. And we hope to see some of you guys that are in the tri-state area on some of Tony's upcoming photo walks. I know we've had a lot of interest in the past and a lot of people asking when we're going to get back to them. So those are all on the site. And uh, Tony, we will uh, see you next time. That's it. All we have for now. And another rendition of BH virtual event space is in the books. Catch y'all next time. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Tony.